Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome to everyone. I'm going to direct my questions to uh, Secretary Tennis. Uh, welcome. Um, Thank you, know, sir. Just very excited to see you here today, and maybe you'd like to introduce uh, the other members. Yes, of the indeed. I, the I forgot to introduce the most important person, I think, here in my department, which is my Deputy Secretary, Kim Bowman. Kim Bowman has uh, extraordinary experience in the field of drug and alcohol. She ran one of the first uh, programs for co-occurring disorder, drug and alcohol, mental health, therapeutic community. She ran one of the first women and children's program for women with small children or women of, uh, who are pregnant in, in uh, Ch uh, Chester County, I believe it was. <laughs> and after that, doing that for many years, she ran what I think was really a model county drug and alcohol office. She was kind of a, if we have a mission or an overriding value, it's to leverage the most treatment to get as many people into recovery as possible. She did this, and, and she did this beautifully uh, in Chester County, and uh, I, I, I rely on her on extensively in every possible way for information. Her depth of knowledge could not be deeper. So I'm very appreciative for her, her uh, presence. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Secretary, and thank again. You, thank you for the reminder, too. I, I realized when I was done I would forgotten, and it was an <laughs> and, oversight. And again, uh, welcome, and I'm just so excited. And uh, you know, uh, just a little history to remind the members uh, that this new department was formed under Act 50, uh, which was a bill that was passed back in 2010. Uh, passed out of the House, I think, in the previous session also, by uh, almost a unanimous vote of the House, and uh, was finally signed into law. And I certainly want to commend Governor Corbett for, uh, you know, uh, creating the new department and helping in naming you uh, secretary and 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 uh, secretary Tennis did a good job of explaining your structure and uh, you said it best uh, this is a disease that impacts one in four families in uh, this Commonwealth and uh, you talked a bit about the impact to the other uh, state agencies and the government budget uh, the, there are criminals, three and four of our, our people that are incarcerated in Pennsylvania are there because of an addiction. Uh, That's right. One thing I want to focus on, overdose deaths. I mean, yes. just an, an absolute tragedy around the state of Pennsylvania. Not only happening in our city of Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, but we're hearing more and more Westmoreland County, all across <coughs> the Commonwealth. Uh, you want to comment a little bit about, uh, you know, what your department <coughs> is doing uh, to, to kind of counteract these overdose deaths, and maybe a little bit talk about a little bit about uh, the prescription drug monitoring bill, which I have just moved out of committee. Well, the prescription. Uh, well, first of all, there is quite a spike in drug overdose deaths, and they are, and that primarily is driven by prescription drugs. Uh, we're seeing this in, in one county, in particular Westmoreland County, where last year the record of overdose deaths, actually three years running, four years running, excuse me, they've broken the previous year's record, and this year of drug overdose deaths, almost overwhelming majority are prescription drug overdoses. Uh, this year in 2013, they're on a pace to go half again over what they did in the previous year. So we're finding this throughout. Uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, or in terms of drug-induced deaths, it's 15.5 per 100,000. Uh, there are a number of, this is, prescription drugs is pretty much takes up probably the majority of, of our time because it's really driving uh, our drug problem right now. There are a number of key components. Prescription monitoring programs are a critical component. Uh, I'm actually chair of the National Alliance on Model State Drug Laws and of the Update and Drafting Committee, and the bill that you introduced was, I believe, was taken from the model PMP law, and you've worked with the National Alliance. Uh, that has proven effective throughout uh, the country in terms of reducing, uh, it's preventing doctor shopping, and of course the way it works is that when a uh, patient comes in and the doctor uh, has any reason at all to be concerned about whether there's something amiss with the individual, they can go online, they can find out what that individual's prescri prescription obtaining history has been. This will help doctors find doctor shoppers. These are mostly addicts, some are businessmen that will go out and sell the drugs, but it has, it's a proven way to reduce it. There are a number of other uh, ways of approaching this issue, and we're looking at quite a few. Uh, <coughs> With any of these problems, I think it's it's probably you would share with with us the concern that we we care most about our young people. Young people are getting these prescription drugs out of medicine cabinets throughout uh, throughout the Commonwealth. They get them out of the medicine cabinets of their families, their their friends' families, or grandparents. Um, and we know there's a habit 
it's, a, it's probably ingrained habit when we get prescri uh, prescription drugs pr given to us or, or from the doctor, we hold on to them in case we're gonna need them again. But what's happening now is kids are getting started on prescription opioids and they're getting addicted by getting them out of medicine cabinets. Uh, this has caused also an uptick in heroin use because what happens is they get addicted on the prescription opioids, but then it becomes too difficult or too expensive to access them and you can get high, cheaper, on heroin. Very, very dangerous. It brings in all kinds of other problems. One of the things that's occurred in Bucks County, and I want to just laud your district attorney, Dave Heckler, in Bucks County for a program and, uh, that they're doing where they have put permanent repositories. In addition to running the kind of take-back programs that you've probably all heard about and may have in your counties, they're putting permanent repositories up in police stations. They have to be under, law under DEA regulations. They have to be under law enforcement eyes all the time that they're available to the public. They've got them now in over 20 police stations in municipalities throughout Bucks County, and they're collecting a steadily high rate of prescription drugs that are being brought back. Uh, I know for myself, take back events are great because they publicize the, they're, they're a good chance to raise public awareness about the dangers of keeping abusable prescription drugs in your medicine cabinet when you're not using them. But to remember the day, the time, and the place when you have to take them is a challenge even for me. And I think for individuals that are, that are needing these, it can be really tough to remember all that. To know that any time of day, you know, during the work week or during the weekend, you can go at any point to your police station and you can drop these. They, have the, they look like mailboxes. They have the repositories. You can drop them there. They have a uh, system they've worked out with our de Department of Environmental Protection and, and the Federal uh, Drug Enforcement Administration, the procedures for proper uh, dispo uh, monitoring and disposal. So take back programs or something. We're working with, with Bucks County, with the DA's Association, with the uh, Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, to, to take a program like he did statewide. But the PMP works very, very well. We, we need to ultimately look at pain clinic legislation and see how much some pain clinics do legitimate pain medicine, but we know that at least, in a, we, I don't know the extent that it is, and one of the things we have to look at is how much we have this in Pennsylvania, but we know across the country that there's been a problem with some pain clinics that really aren't practicing medicine, they're really pill mills, and you'll see individuals lined up outside getting the prescription drugs, so that's another angle. Another uh, approach is, and this is more at the federal level, and we've sent a letter into the to the uh, uh, FDA, and that's tamper-resistant opioids. We know that oxycotton abuse dropped off somewhat, and some of the other opioids when they were in a tamper-resistant technology. It's just a little piece of the answer, but it is part of the answer. Uh, their pa patents are running out, so that means the generic oxy equivalents of Oxycontin and these other drugs are gonna be coming online. If they are not tamper resistant, then whatever gains we realized with the, the work that was done in, in, in the other tamper resistant technology is gonna be lost and that's gonna cause a, a spike up as well. The other issue is just prevention. And one of the issues I wanted to get a chance to talk about and r really looking for all of your help too is this opportunity we have now with life skills training for sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Um, Life skills training is an evidence-based practice. It's one of the premier prevention programming. It helps kids learning to, to, to develop uh, peer resistance skills, which is critical for that age, uh, better decision making in all aspects of their life, and it shows a reduction in marijuana use of about 67%, 66% reduction in use of drugs. Uh, I, alcohol is somewhere around 60%, tobacco use 87%. This is on offer in Pennsylvania to every school district for free. Every school district who asks for it, and the, all of your school superintendents have been sent this from the Secretary of Education. Uh, uh, I signed onto the letter, uh, this, the Secretary of DPW. Uh, PCCD, JC, Juvenile Court Judges Commission have all signed on and we're urging uh, all of our school superintendents, particularly the ones where they have more of a problem, to sign on for life skills training. It's all free for three years. Not only do they train the teachers, but they will pay the school districts the cost of the substitute teachers while the teachers are brought out for the two days of training. They provide all the materials for free, the technical assistance, and it's proven, proven to reduce substance abuse among our kids. 
Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, you, Secretary Tennyson. And again, about the prescription drugs, uh, I mean, I heard it once said that the new drug dealer in town, as you described, is your own medicine cabinet in your own home. And uh, with my prescription drug monitoring bill, I'd like to see it put in your department. Uh, I mean, you know, I know there's some, been some discussion about where it should go, but I believe it should go into your department because it's not only a law enforcement tool, this is a treatment and prevention tool, and that's why I'd like to see it housed in your department. One, one more quick question. Uh, uh, methadone death review team, uh, we passed a bill uh, last session that created yes. the new team. and Give us a little update on if it's up and running or where, right. where you're at with that right now. Yes, it's Act 148 of last year, and I thank you all for passing that. That's important. In fact, the only question I think I got last year was from Chairman Adolph about methadone, and it's a been it's something that I've been hearing about from legislators and from the field uh, concerns about that. We had our first, first methadone death review team meeting yesterday morning. Uh, we have a, a, a really, uh, I think, uh, uh, highly credentialed group of individuals that meet the statutory requirements of taking the liberty of adding in a few other people. So a couple of doctors from DPW are working with us and giving us tremendous expertise. Uh, <clears throat> and. We've already identified, we have a lot of cases that are coming in. We're going to, we're going to look at some cases at, in 2012 just to sort of hone our procedures. We're, we're, we just started, so we have to look and make sure we're gathering all the cases. So we're working with the coroners and medical examiners to develop a, the form that, you, that Act 148 requires us to form. We're going to have something online and in paper that anybody can provide us with reports of methadone deaths and incidents. It's a really well-crafted piece of legislation even yesterday, we identified right up front about three areas, and we're going to be keeping a list of tentative recommendations. Uh, one has to do with medical monitoring during induction. We've had we have deaths, uh, a, a really terrible case of a 19-year-old during induction uh, who died, and. We want to have closer medical monitoring. We're looking at, at, at where are the points where people are dying. Uh, deaths occur in different ways. One of the ways they occur is com combining methadone and benzodiazepines. And I've spent a lot of time with parents of kids and, and other individuals, loved ones of people, where they've combined those two. We identified yesterday that we have to be looking at how well are we doing detecting other drugs in their system. If they have benzos in their system, should they even be given them? Are there other ways to deal with anxiety disorders with individuals on methadone other than giving them benzodiazepines? Because there are two problems with that. One is if the combination, if they have enough of it, they can still get high. The idea of methadone is you're not going to be able to get high anymore. But if you take benzos and methadone, you can. Number two, if the dosage is sufficient, you will go into respiratory arrest and die. And that's where a number of the deaths are. The other area that we've seen in, in the cases that we've gathered are car crashes. So one of the issues we have to look at, and it's really tricky, is where, at what point, is it safe for somebody to drive that's on methadone? The, the initial information that I've gotten, and I actually spent a fair amount of time talking with the previous licensure division director, Cheryl Williams, is that during the first two weeks of induction, or two weeks after any increase in dosage, there tends to be more danger of the person dozing off at the wheel, or losing, basically passing out at the wheel and being an unsafe driver. We have to look and see whether that's true or not. And we have to look at how do we what procedures need to be in place for methadone clinics to ensure that the person uh, isn't driving. I mean, we can identify it. We could tell the clinic, don't let them drive home. But then once somebody drives them home, what, what if they want to get in the car and go to the grocery store? So how do we handle those periods of time? A lot of individuals on methadone have jobs. They, they might need to drive to their work, particularly if they're in rural areas. So there's some really difficult issues. But what's good about this legislation is it's really going to give us a, a, a very good picture of what is really driving the death rate, what's really driving the rate of, of injury, of serious injuries, or these situations where we've had a couple of where individuals have run into school buses. Fortunately, no kids hurt. But uh, it's an excellent piece of legislation. We've got a motivated group. We're going to meet monthly, uh, probably three or four hours a month at first until we kind of get our sea legs. And uh, we're, getting, we're, we're doing redundant information gathering. So in addition to gathering information from our 
licensure division and from the coroners, we've already reached out to the district attorneys, to the police chiefs, to the state police, to our county drug and alcohol directors, and we're asking all of them, when these cases come up, and they're not just deaths, but uh, seri serious bodily injury cases or unreasonable risk is how the legislation's drafted, send them to us. A side benefit that that's going to give us is, is our reporting, are our reporting mechanisms right? I actually believe one of our biggest problems in the state and in, in the country, really, is we don't get accurate reporting on drug and alcohol deaths. And it's kind of, it's spotty from county to county, it's spotty from state to state. This is not something peculiar to Pennsylvania. Uh, we, in working with the coroners on getting methadone reporting, we've already started the discussion with them and with the Department of Health, uh, their vital statistics people. We've done really good beginning work in terms of trying to make sure we're gathering all the information on not just methadone deaths, but other deaths as well, so that we can come back to you and give you more accurate information about what the real overdose rate is. Okay. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Mr. S uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and uh, keep up the good work, Kim and Terry, and Secretary Tennis. And uh, if, if I could just leave you with a message, I, I, I'd like to see you continue to try to consolidate all the different pieces that have to do with drug and alcohol that are within some of the other departments, and try and get them into your department. I would really like to see uh, the uh, drug and alcohol share of BHSI, which is in the Department of Welfare, consolidated into your department. So again, thank you, and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you, Chair.